that's sort of amazing. And that's a really good point to make because I know, I'm not sure if you've been following the, um, the media lately in terms of the baby boomers. And they're basically saying that for the next 19 years, 10,000 people per day will turn 65 in which, depending on which estimate you look at, 75 to 90 percent of those baby boomers are not in position to retire. And they're looking at also the decline in Social Security, Medicare, things that will affect them in terms of their standard of living. So, of course, you mentioning that you can actually convert uh, or transfer that property out of your Roth into your name to live in, that's a pretty good strategy, which a lot of people are looking to adapt in order to basically downscale to make sure that their retirement funds carry them through retirement. Right. And so one thing we have to do is distinguish that there's two different types of accounts in general that we're talking about here. So there's what they call a regular IRA. And for the most part, you take tax deductions when you put money into that IRA. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the possibility of doing rollovers from other retirement accounts. Correct. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that in a moment. And the when you take the money out at a later time, you're going to have a tax. That's correct. So usually your traditional IRA, your SEP IRA, uh, your simple IRA, 401ks, any employer-sponsored plan is usually going to be a tax-deferred account, uh, the, with the exception of the Roth, where uh, you basically are going to pay no taxes on that type of account based on any gains. So if you were to convert money from a tax-deferred account, say a traditional IRA, you're going to pay taxes on that amount converted over. But any growth that you realize within, say, five years and 59 and a half, beyond that period of time, you pay no taxes. So there's two milestones. You have to have the account for five years, in addition to be 59 and a half. So any growth that you experience beyond those two milestones, you don't have to worry about paying any taxes on those. Right. So that's the second then alternative is the Roth. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you're not getting a tax deduction for when you're putting the money in up front. Correct. And uh, then the, when you eventually take the money out, then there won't be a tax at that time. Mm -hmm. And so we've got two considerations. One is, is there going to be a tax inside of the account itself that a lot of people don't even think about? Mm -hmm. Well, for a traditional account, that hasn't been an issue. But then there is the issue of um, then when you put the money in and when you take the money out, and, and what is the consequence there? Mm -hmm. And um, so you brought up the issue of the conversion. I think we'll go ahead and, and just talk about it for a moment. Okay. So for 2010, we had a special election that was available, and that was to take the money out of a regular retirement account, you know, where you had the tax deduction and it would be taxable when you take it out, and then convert it to a Roth. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, in 2010, you had uh, the ability, if you converted either a portion or the full amount of monies from a tax deferred account over to a Roth. You had the ability to, one, the income restrictions above $150,000 was lifted. That was one milestone, in which that's something that's still in play as it, as it stands moving forward. The other would have been if you were to convert, you had the ability to spread your tax liability over 2011, 2012 in two equal installments. So if you were buying and flipping and you're receiving double digit returns and if the numbers worked out for you, you had two years to have to pay off Uncle Sam based on that amount converted. Well, 2011 moving forward, you still have the ability to convert, but you don't have that two year option to pay off the tax liability. Right. So it used to be if you had too much gross income, you just couldn't do a conversion, and that was lifted, and that was a huge thing for 2010. Correct. And then, as we said, that will continue as far as we know into right, the future. So. <laughs> and then, uh, And then we've got the election only available for 2010. We have the choice. Mm -hmm. So we can either go ahead and pay the tax all in 2010. We also have the choice that we can have it taxed as two pieces, 50% in 2011, 50% in 2012. Correct. Each spouse has the choice mm -hmm. if you file jointly Correct. or separately. And um, so anyway, this is a big thing for last year. And you have one other thing, and that is, let's say that the account value takes a dive. Mm. Okay, well, if you... Well, you have until October 15th of 2010, even if you file, I believe, on time. Right. If you, if you don't extend the due date for your tax return, they will still let you change your mind up to October 15th mm -hmm. of, uh, of 2011. And so then you have to undo the deed and put the money back. Right. 
but uh, anyway, it's sort of an exciting thing uh, for last year. I don't know how many people actually did it. But, uh. <laughs> well, and there was also, and we're speaking of cash currently, but uh, yeah. there was also those who had assets, right. real estate in particular, in a self-directed right. IRA that lost value. So, of course, an excellent time to have converted yes. would have been either in 2010 or even moving forward where the values are lower. So when the value does come back, you're not taxed on the appreciated value. So that's one of the things you may want to uh, factor in as well as an option. Right. So... Um as I said, you can't make contributions to one of these accounts uh, in, in assets, but you are allowed to do rollovers as mm -hmm. property, including these conversions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there were quite a few people, I understand, or at least it was uh, discussed and suggested, that uh, because the values were low, that they may want to have it done uh, where they convert from a regular IRA to a Roth, Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's required in that case is that you actually have to have an appraisal done. Because that's correct. They have to know wh what how much are. income to tax. Right, right. All right. Let's talk about uh, income tax returns uh, and unrelated business taxable income. So I guess I'll just sort of ask the question, can IRAs actually have to file income tax returns? Usually when it comes to UBIT or UDFI, which is unrelated business income tax or unrelated debt finance income tax, usually that can apply if you're using any form of leverage, especially when it comes to UDFI, every year based on whatever amount, say if you have X amount of dollars in rent that's generating income and you use leverage on that particular property, you could be subject to UBIT or UDFI uh, for that form of income. So that's one of the things you have definitely want to sit down with your uh, tax uh, professional, whether it be a tax attorney or CPA, before considering that option because, once again, it's something that you may want to factor into your numbers, which a lot of people aren't aware when they shop for those type of loans. Yeah. So in other words, when you're deciding on making one of these alternative investments, there's an additional expense that you have to factor in, and that Correct. is that there is going to have to be an income tax return possibly prepared. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can apply, uh, well, one is if we, like we said, you've got a debt-financed property, mm -hmm. uh, then the part of the rent uh, that's attributable to the, uh, the amount that you borrowed. The percentage, percentage borrowed, percentage, right. right. That part's going to be possibly subject to income tax. Right. Um, also, though, if you've got some sort of a business that you're operating under this um, entity, then you could also uh, be subject to filing. An example would be, uh, I know a client had actually uh, purchased a dry cleaner. So of course, UBIT or unrelated business income tax would come into play because of the equipment within the dry cleaner would subject them to the UBIT tax. So mm -hmm. that was one of the things that once again, they had not factored when they had come to me, but mm -hmm. once again, I basically conveyed to them that something they want to sit down with their tax attorney to factor that in. Yeah, so let's we'll talk about that again uh, in more detail in another uh, interview. But one thing that they need to understand too though is who is responsible for having that tax return prepared? Well, as, <laughs> as it relates to that, the individual, the account yeah. holder is responsible, not interest. Yeah. They, so when that's something that's uh, real, we have to usually convey to the account holder. We take care of any tax reporting as it relates to the IRA, but when it comes to that portion, that's something that the individual has to take care of on, within their tax uh, returns. Yeah. So a lot of people don't understand that. They think, oh, this is all going to be taken yeah. care of, and they're responsible for getting that income tax return taken care of. Yeah, and a good point is that uh, I know a lot of people will usually, they like the idea of a self-directed IRA, but it's really important, it's something I emphasize, that a self-directed IRA is not for everyone, and it's really important. We, we're talking now about consulting with a CPA and attorney. I think it's critical that you definitely consult with one before you move forward on any investment because everything else may work out, but there's definitely or could be tax implications. And interest, we're not in a position to give any advice or uh, give you any advice, whether it be tax or financial or legal advice, so definitely consult with your professionals in that area. So um, we're getting down to about the last four minutes just to let you know where we are. Um, anyway, uh, there is one issue. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but I do want to bring it up, and I'm not even sure how familiar you, you are with it, uh, but that has to do with this area of, uh, of quick flipping of properties. Mm -hmm. and. Um, 
so when you're involved, if you're not holding a property for investment, okay, that can be considered to be a trader business. Okay. And so that means that those transactions can actually be subject to ordinary income tax. In other words, unrelated business tax mm -hmm. for the IRA or for the Roth. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of aggressive real estate operators out there and they think that, you know, uh, I'm investing in real estate, I can do it with impunity with this account. And that's not necessarily the that's case. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to bring that up because of this whole area that we're talking about. Can you think of some disadvantages of investing in real estate in an IRA or a Roth? Uh, the most common disadvantage or would be relative to a disadvantage is a lack of experience, lack of education, and uh, lack of due diligence. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in terms of building your retirement account with a self-directed IRA. And um, if it's an area, I would say focus on an area that you are um, apt to be able to succeed in. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're not educated in that area, seek that education. But I would say those three areas, uh, due diligence, education, and um, just making sure you're knowledgeable in that area is, is, is really key. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is well, a couple of things. One is um, the pro prohibitive transaction thing. So you can't like buy a property and rent it to your brother or, or something like that. Or actually, a brother might be okay. But uh, Well, the brother is fine, yeah. But, but certain family members, you've got to be very careful and watch what you're doing uh, related to that because it's easy to get tripped up. Right, and just a simple model I'll use in terms of letting those know who, um, who they can and cannot work with. Usually anyone who's on the vertical line of the relationship is prohibited and anyone who's on the horizontal line is permissible. So if you can kind of keep that in mind and of course if you forget, you know, definitely pick up the phone, give us a call and we'll let you know. That is one of our objectives to make sure you're not pr committing any form of prohibited transaction as it relates to on the onset of your, the structure of your transaction. Okay. We're about out of time. There's you know, maybe one or two other things I did want to discuss, but maybe I'll just I'll let you uh, take a moment and throw out maybe uh, any particular words of wisdom that you want to share as we wrap this thing up. Well, I mean, we're living some very unusual times right now, and uh, what a lot of people may have known in terms of uh, education and knowledge for his investment may not apply today, so it's really important to re-educate yourself in terms of what's happening currently and what's projected to happen in the future because a lot of um, investment models may have worked in the past, may not work now, so that's really important. Uh, there's a multitude of investment options and vehicles out there. Do your due diligence, find out which one is going to be the best for you. Uh, when I say focus on truly diversifying your retirement account, find out everything that's available to you and um, explore all options. Okay. Lamar, thank you for being my guest thank today. You. It's a pleasure having you as a guest on my okay. show. So, folks, uh, I hope that we've given you something to think about, uh, an alternative that's available for you, and uh, maybe to investigate further and to be sure to get good advice. Oh, definitely. And uh, we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. <laughs>